Egalitarianism is the doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. If you do not subscribe to this definition, then you may need to ask yourself who deserves less than you. We live in a very strange time when people over decades have sacrificed much for equality of all, but there is a brand of people pejoratively known as social justice warriors and third wave feminists, often interchangeably, or shall we say intersectionally, who want more rights and opportunities for specific groups of people. It's not so much they want more, and they do, it's that desire less for people they consider part of the institution of, for example, cis-het white male patriarchy. Now that's a mouthful. Here is a chart showing a group of people, persons A through D. Who on this chart deserves more or less equality, power, opportunity, or any other category you can imagine? The choices shown do not represent a specific race, sex, weight, gender, identity, age, religious, or political view. Seems silly, but this is obviously an impossibly flawed chart if you are an adherent to identity politics. For an SJW to be able to answer, you would have to know where each person scores on the oppression Olympics. For women who have struggled for centuries to be free of the role of just mother or future bride, i.e. property of her father or husband, equality that has never been seen before in human history has been hard fought and won. Over the last hundred years or so, women's rights victories include women gaining the right to vote, access to birth control and abortion, and equal pay. With no fault divorce, women can get divorced just because they want to. Under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978, a woman cannot be denied a job or promotion or be fired because she is or may become pregnant. Signed by President Obama in 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Restoration Act allows employees to file a complaint of pay discrimination within six months of receiving their last paycheck. The Civil War ended hundreds of years of brutal enslavement for blacks in the United States, but the oppression did not end with this bloody war. For decades, Jim Crow laws made the promise of the American dream unachievable for many Americans. Although gaining the franchise decades before women, the right to vote was not fully codified into law until passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. In 1954, the Supreme Court declared segregation of public schools illegal in Brown versus Board of education, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mandated the segregation of most public accommodations. We move forward with the Fair Housing Act of 1968. In 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removes homosexuality from its list of mental disorders in the DSM-2 Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. November 1995 saw hate crimes sentencing enhancement act going into effect as part of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. June 2003, the Supreme Court strikes down the Homosexual Conduct Law, which decriminalizes same-sex sexual conduct. September 2011, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed, ending a ban on gay men and lesbians from serving openly in the military. June of 2013, in United States v. Windsor, the U.S. Supreme Court strikes down Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, ruling that legally married same-sex couples are entitled to federal benefits. Two years later, the Supreme Court rules that states cannot ban same-sex marriage. And in 2016, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter announces that the Pentagon is lifting the ban on transgender people serving openly in the U.S. military. The immense progress that was made over the decades was due to civil rights leaders who gained the support of the population. People like Martin Luther King and Susan B. Anthony were inclusive. It's not very productive to alienate the masses in order to make life more equal for some. Those who want to maintain the status quo will not willingly accept change unless they are convinced it is a better way. We return to egalitarianism, a concept today few would disagree with. Even though the state of equality in North America as well as many parts of the world has increased to a most worthy point, there is some refinement needed and of course the parts of the world that do not enjoy such freedom, whose people desire a life afforded to many in the West, they want freedom of conscience, the end to social caste systems and nearly half of those females strive for the same rights as men 
to not be property of their husbands. Having freedom comes with responsibility, and it is my view that dividing and demonizing people for how they are born is not a productive approach. This takes us to a few websites that have caught the attention of reasonable people lately. The first is Everyday Feminism. It's not as much their website, but a particular page linked from the main one. Here we are introduced to the concept of healing from toxic whiteness. Yes, for a fee, you can have access to an online training program for white people committed to racial justice. I won't bore you with the odious concepts espoused here, but I will I will discuss a few items on the site. Lenora tells us, Healing from toxic whiteness provides white anti-racists with crucial missing tools for the most challenging aspect of our work, navigating our own emotional reactions when confronted with the realities of white supremacy. These tools help us to work through our knee-jerk tendency to reject ourselves or other white people when we encounter how racism operates through us. With these tools, we can take on one of the most crucial responsibilities to engage in productive dialogue with those who knowingly or unknowingly defend white supremacy. Now, how does one go about doing this once you notice just how insidious and ingrained racism really is? This assumes that racism is ingrained. Racism is indeed insidious, but this is more about finger pointing at everyone. How can I make sure I don't accidentally say something that's racist and hurts people I care about? By being considerate of others. Perhaps you need to renegotiate your ill-spent time in kindergarten class for the basics. I know I need to speak up against racism more, but when does speaking up cross the line into speaking over people of color? Well, speaking over anyone is rude. There is no need to point out any one group of people. This focus on people of color is itself divisive. Learn to have conversations with others. Listen and learn. What do I do when I discover I've been subconsciously stereotyping and judging people of color? Here's the problem with the word subconscious. If something is operating or existing outside of consciousness, it is by definition something out of reach. But there is good news. Stop judging people based solely on how they were born or the decisions they have made about their life that does not hurt anyone. If you have not mastered being in control of your own thoughts, forget about the subconscious ones. I feel so guilty about having white privilege, but am I really willing to give up that privilege? Do I even know what that means? Simple answer, no. You don't know what a non-existent condition means. How can I figure out what I should be doing to fight racism without burdening people of color by constantly asking them, what should I do? Is this how people combat racism? By pestering people of color who obviously have all the answer to life's greatest troubles? How do I deal with the fact that I'm scared to talk to other white people about racism when they often get really angry at me? It's more than likely that after spending so much time annoying people of color, you're also making a nuisance of yourself to other white people and they want you to go away and hide in your safe space. Just who are these wise sages willing to take your hard-earned dollars to teach you about the fatal disease of toxic whiteness? Sandra Kim and Dara Silverman will gladly relieve you of your toxic white burdens along with your toxic white cash. If you're not satisfied with whiteness being a deadly contagion, then you can move on to being a man as a pathology. Very little is known of the serious condition known as mascopathy. There is a reason for that. It doesn't exist. The people over at Everyday Feminism want us to know that having light skin is a terrible affliction that sending money to them can abate. The folks here at the Institute for the Prevention and Treatment of Mascopathy, did I say that right? Mascopathy? Also want your money so they can sell you books in case you overdose on masculinity. This clever institute's mission statement is as follows. The mission of the Institute for the Prevention and Treatment of Mascopathy is to increase awareness and understanding of the individual and social consequences of pathological masculinity and to replace it with a balanced and liberated manhood that is open-hearted, accountable, compassionate, and egalitarian. Believe it or not, these mascopathy, mascopathy are a slight improvement on the toxic white people since they at least pay lip service to egalitarianism. What is mascopathy, you ask? Well, first you have to be able to pronounce it. But according to the people of this institute, it is 
Men often behave badly. Some are grandiose and aggressive. Many others are worthy and admirable, but often emotionally absent and relationally disappointing. Virtually all men struggle to some degree with masculopathy, a pathology of masculinity which erodes balance and healthy humanity. The Institute for the Prevention and Treatment of Masculopathy provides education to help boys avoid masculopathy, therapy for men to recover, and advocacy for a more egalitarian society. I like that egalitarian society. It is sort of funny that the symptoms of this new ailment are the same whether you are male or female. I wonder how many hospitals or clinics are now treating the dreaded masculopathy. These fine people at the Institute, potential candidates for a Nobel Prize, appear to be the only ones offering the cure. Buy their books. Very interesting. At least this institute is a bargain at $30. I assume per year, compared to the toxic white people healers, it's a steal. So the solution is to blame all white people and men. But what is the problem? Send this channel just $400 and we'll cure you of whatever it is you want to blame whoever it is. There are major issues and to their credit are often addressed by SJW, such as economic class issues. With more of the percent of wealth concentrated at the top of the pyramid, there is less mobility at the bottom. Rather than fight each other and go on a blaming frenzy, there are things that can be addressed. Not easily, but still. Thank you again for checking this channel. If you find yourself feeling kind, then please hit that like button or subscribe below. If you're feeling kind and generous, please consider contributing to this righteous cause by visiting our new Patreon page, where we will gladly take the money you would have wasted on the websites talked about here. Goodbye. Goodbye.